it is time to discuss QR factorization. This is when you take a matrix A and you write it as a product Q times R, where R is upper triangular and Q in the real case is orthogonal or in the complex case is unitary. There are several algorithms for doing the QR decomposition of a matrix. They all rely on different geometric interpretations of what the QR decomposition is doing. To start off, let me remind you of a very simple picture from basic linear algebra. Let's consider just R2 for the moment so I can draw a picture. And suppose I have two vectors Let's call them V and W. Something you might want to consider is the projection of W onto V. The projection of W onto V. Well, visually it's very easy to see. This is the vector pointing in the direction of V which is obtained by projecting perpendicularly off of W onto the direction of V. So essentially what we're doing is we're decomposing W into two components. A piece that looks like V and a piece that goes perpendicular to V. You may recall that to do this projection we do the following. First of all, we take advantage of the dot product, or the inner product. So we look at V, uh, let's say W star V. So that would be, if, 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 if uh, V were length 1, this would be the appropriate length um, for the cosine, to compute the cosine of this angle. But if v is not length 1, then we have to divide by the norm of v. Now, we want this to be a vector. Currently, this is a scalar, so it has to go in the direction of v. And again, perhaps uh, v is not length 1, in which case we have to divide by its length, so we end up with this formula. So in other words, the formula is w star v over v star v times the vector v. This is the projection of w onto v. You probably used dot product in some previous class, but since we're using Hermitian products here in the complex case, this is the correct formula. Okay, so what we want to do for QR factorization um, is a process called Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization. So the idea here is that if we have a sequence of vectors, say like v and w, we want to change it into a, a, uh, an orthogonal set, an orthonormal set in fact. So in this case, in this simple picture, we would, uh, let me draw a small version of this picture here, we'd take v and first of all we'd rescale it to be length 1. And then we'd use w and use the part of w that's not in the direction of v to get this vector. And so from V and W, we'd obtain these two vectors, which form a basis of R2, um, and are somehow the orthogonal basis that's in some sense aligned with V and W. Of course, it depends on the order. If we did W first, it would look somewhat different. But this is the process we're going to do. Okay, let's do the basic Gram-Schmidt process. Suppose you have a list of vectors, V1, v2, and so on up to vk. These are vectors in, let's say, c, uh, n. So overall, if I think about a matrix, I could make a matrix A whose columns are the v's. If I do so, this would be a matrix which is n by k. So in fact we will be doing something like a QRD composition of A, an n by k matrix. 
But that's sort of beside the point. I want to focus on these vectors. So what I want to do is I want to make a new list of vectors built out of these. They're all length 1 and that are all perpendicular. So here's the process. First of all, take the first vector and divide it by its length. Let's call that u1. We now have our first new vector. Easy enough. Okay. Now we need our second vector. It's going to be built out of v1 and v2. So we're going to build this sequentially. So I have the vector v2, and I want the part of v2 that's not in the direction of u1. So I'm going to take v2 and subtract off the part that is in the direction of u1. So this is guaranteed to be perpendicular to u1. However, it might not be length 1. So let's divide by its length. Let's call this u2. In terms of a formula, it's quite easy to write down. v2 minus, let's see, the projection operator, we can write as v2 star u1. Now u1 is already length 1, but if I write that in terms of, well, if I write that in terms of v1, it's v1 over uh, v1 norm squared v1. And then all that over its length. So all this also ends up down there. Okay, now I need a third vector. Let's take v3. If these are all independent, then there's some part of v3 that's not in the direction of v1 and not in the direction of v2. Notice that u1 and u2 span the same sp subspace as v1 and v2. So in fact, we're building what's often called a flag, where it's a sequence of subspaces, and each one adds one more dimension. So v1 spans a space, and u1 spans the same space. v1 and v2 together span a space, and u1 and u2 together span that same subspace. So v3 has a part that's not in the direction of u1 or u2. So let's find it. Let's take v3 and subtract off the part that's in the u1 direction. And then, let's subtract off the part that's in the u2 direction. Now that is the part of v3 that is not in the direction of u1 or u2. That might not be length 1, so let's divide by it. This is u3. Notice that u3 is, well, let me put it this way, the span of u1, u2, u3 is the same as the span of v1, v2, v3. You could, of course, expand this in terms of the stars. I won't do that because it won't fit on the page, but the formula is quite direct. By the way, you might worry about the order of subtracting these. Actually, because, so u1 and u2, first of all, are perpendicular, so there's sort of no conflict in separating off the direction of u1 and the direction of u2. This whole structure here relies on the v's being independent, otherwise we still have some sort of breakdown um, in terms of these subspaces. But that's fine. Okay, so there's one more thing to say. It's easy to check, given this structure, that note This is constructed so that each ui has length 1. And it's constructed, uh, recursively in fact, so that ui star uj is 0 if i is not equal to j. So the new u's that we obtain this way sequentially, u1, u2, u up to uk, uh, is an orthogonal set. It's an orthonormal set. If k equals n, 
then this is actually a, this gives us a square matrix. So if, in fact, we're working with n vectors. This is an n by n matrix, which is a unitary matrix. Okay, so what does this have to do with QRD composition? Well, what we want to do is consider the relationship between the V's and the U's. So if we look back at our original expression here, uh, let me just write it sort of symbolically. V1, or rather, let me do it this way, U1 is some multiple of V1. U2 is some multiple of V1 and V2. U3 is some linear combination of V1, V2, and V3. And so on. The last one is a linear combination of all of them. So let's look what we have here. If we write this as a matrix relationship on the columns, so here I have the V's, again this would be an N by K matrix, And if I want to obtain the U's, put those in the column in, in the columns of a matrix. What's the relationship here? Well, remember that if you do right multiplication, uh, what you're doing is taking linear combinations of the columns. So this first column is a combination of these columns. It's the combination which involves C11 copies of the first one and no copies of the remaining ones. U2 is a combination C21 and C22 of the first two and nothing of the remaining ones, and so on diagonally up to CK1 up to CKK. So this is a K by K matrix as necessary. It's upper triangular. So we've written a V equals uh, VC equals U, where V is our original um, list of vectors, ma making a matrix A. C is upper triangular, and U is the new unitary set of matrices that we made, or orthonormal set. Now the inverse of a upper triangular matrix is upper triangular. And by the way, C is definitely invertible, because if we assume that the Vs are independent, then all these coefficients must be non-zero to produce these, as these are all orthogonal and therefore independent. So we use some sort of replacement lemma statement here to say that C must be invertible. So uh, perhaps I should call this A to fit my previous notation, and then this is R inverse. Okay, I apologize for the bad writing, but what we've written here is A equals U R. And usually we call this thing Q instead of U, right? So the notation's all over the place. But uh, A equals QR, so I'm thinking about the columns of A as being vectors that I want to sequentially normalize and orthogonalize. That yields the matrix Q, whose columns are, the, are those orthogonal vectors, and R is the transformation that takes you between them. So this is a nutshell, is QR decomposition. Uh, it's essentially proven here, and this process of constructing the U's out of the V's this way is called the Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization process. This, it turns out, is a really good way to solve lots of linear systems of equations. So previously we had the singular value decomposition, which has all sorts of geometric meaning. And this, of course, has geometric meaning also. So in a short while, we're going to apply both of these to solving linear systems of equations numerically. And the geometry is really going to help us there. Before we do that, though, we have to discuss a couple more things about QR decomposition. As it turns out, this algorithm, although it makes sense sort of geometrically and computationally, is not great if you do it numerically with approximations. And so we're going to fix that by improving this algorithm in a couple subtle ways. 
We also have to discuss the overall idea of what projection means, and um, then start discussing how we approximate floating point numbers in a computer, and that's going to be the next big topic after QRD composition.